I've looked forward to talking to our next guest for a long time because I've been using the statistics and data uh, he and his group have put together at the Democracy at Work website for a long time in my own writing. That's at democracyatwork.info. Uh, Richard Wolf is professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts. Amherst, he is currently a visiting professor in the Graduate Program of International Affairs at the New School University in New York. And he is host of the program Economic Update on Free Speech TV, which airs Tuesdays from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, and he uh, joins us now. There's a lot I want to catch up with him on, so let's get right to it. First of all, Richard, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate the uh, opportunity. Uh, I wanted to start with, uh, maybe we can start with this. Um, one of uh, capitalism's opponents, uh, greatest spokespeople, I would say, unintentionally so perhaps, is uh, Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon is the CEO, as you know, of J.P. Morgan Chase. And uh, in my opinion, through his example and through his statements, a great illustration of what's wrong with the system as it exists today. And Jamie Dimon once said in the wake of the financial crisis that his industry cost in 2008. He told a congressional panel, uh, a financial crisis, he says, I told my little daughter when she came home from school that if she said, Daddy, what's a financial crisis? And he, and, and I told her that's something that happens every five to seven years. Uh, so he's very dismissive of the suffering caused by the 2008 financial crisis, but he was basically right, wasn't he, in the sense that we do live under a system that uh, malfunctions every so often and that that malfunction is built into it? Absolutely. And uh, I, I have to take my hat off to Jamie Dimon. Uh, in my experience talking to bankers, they are not that familiar with the history of capitalism. He evidently is. Here's the simple statistic. Uh, the records are kept by something called the National Bureau of Economic Research, which monitors the ups and downs of the capitalist economy here in the United States. And it has done elaborate research, not just on the United States, but on the world. And basically, here's the result. Over the last two to three hundred years, wherever capitalism has settled in to become the dominant economy, in England in the 18th century, and then basically spreading across the world. It has an economic downturn every four to seven years on average. That means some of them are longer and some of them are shorter and all that. But every four to seven years on average, you have a sudden plunge in which large numbers of people are fired, uh, large numbers of businesses go out of business, or at the very least, cut back production, lay off workers. And you have that phenomena for which we have so many words in the English language. Downturn, recession, depression, crisis, crash. I mean, it can go on and on and on. These phenomena mean that capitalism as a system is fundamentally unstable. Everything has been tried for 250 years to prevent this from happening, to make sure that if it does happen, these will be short and shallow, and nothing has been found to work. The intrinsic mechanisms of capitalism have proven to be stronger than any and all corrective uh, efforts ever since, which basically leaves you with the recognition that if you don't want the instability of capitalism, you're going to have to change to another system because we haven't been able to figure out how to cope with this one. Well, that gets me to another <clears throat> question that I wanted to ask you, which is, you know, if I remember correctly from introduction to macroeconomics, you know, you, you, you used all those terms, crash, setback, recession, uh, depression, all the various, you know, depending on intensity or so on. I seem to remember the much more value neutral term business cycle. 
being used. It seems to me, and, and so it seems to me you have a system that you, you, that you described so well that has this inherent malfunction. It's like a car that, you know, every few miles the steering mechanism goes and it runs off the road and you get right. it back on and it runs off the road a few more miles. That seems to me like a defective car, but it seems to me that within the profession of economics where you, you know, your credentials are are beyond reproach. Uh, it seems to me that there is a concerted effort to sort of, well, maybe not a concerted effort, maybe it's a sociological phenomenon of some kind, but it seems to me that it, th there's an accepted uh, viewpoint that says, uh, well, that's just the way it is. And, uh, and, and let's not take too much notice of it. That's just a, 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 a inherent quality in the system. Is that right? Am I getting that right? And is there something seriously oh, wrong with that? Absolutely. But l let me take it a bit further. You're quite right that one of the most, how shall I put it, calming sorts of words to use is business cycle. And indeed, in the aftermath of the worst we've ever had, the Great Depression of the 1930s, courses in economics uh, programs, both at the undergraduate and graduate levels in universities, typically had a course called the business cycle. And the idea behind that was that it would help in future downturns if people were educated about how they arise, why they arise, why they resist all these efforts to prevent them, in the hope that this kind of education would at least give us a leg up on managing the many that will occur in any one of our lifetimes, given that four to seven year average. But after World War II, the enthusiasm of the defenders of capitalism carried them away, as it often does, into the belief that in the aftermath of the Great Depression, some fundamental lessons had been learned about how to manage them, how to prevent them, that monetary policy, the kind of things done by the Federal Reserve, or fiscal policy, the kinds of things done by the Congress and the President, could together finally solve the problem. And in this enthusiastic belief, they ended the courses so that nowadays most curricula in most American colleges and universities have no course on the business cycle. The folly of all of that, the absurdity was brought home to everyone in 2008 when we had the second worst economic crash of capitalism in its history and we're still not out of the ramifications and consequences of that, but the profession, having done this all of its last century, is busy coming up with one argument after another why we don't have to worry about this. All of these downturns will fix themselves, even if it takes, as this one has, a good decade of people's lives destroyed, relationships wrecked, educations postponed or canceled, all of the fallout from these kinds of economic downturns, it's as if the profession needs to pretend it doesn't have to worry about them in the manner of how Jamie Dimon spoke to his daughter. Well, and again, we're talking with Richard Wolf, professor, economist, and host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV. So, uh, okay, so uh, we've got this sort of, so now nobody even wants to tell you to wear a helmet and shoulder pads when you're driving this car that keeps crashing. There's, there's this looking the other way on it. So I look at, uh, I look at the statistics out there and I see that, uh, as you've talked about as well, that the, ha nearly half of all Americans say they don't have $400 for an emergency. Two thirds say they don't have a thousand for an emergency. I just had an emergency healthcare treatment, $3,500. Um, so uh, we have that fragility. We have the new UN report on the, the widespread poverty, including some very deep poverty in this 
country. We have the other uh, study done showing that nearly half of all Americans can't pay their basic expenses, including health care and housing and food. So it seems to me we as a people are in no shape. There is, we're not making it as it is, and yet we're, we're overdue for the next bump, what, the next crash, the next uh, business cycle, if you will. It's, are, are we standing on the verge of disaster here? I'm afraid I wish I didn't have to tell you this, but the answer is yes. Let me be careful though here. No one can predict the future. You know, you go to a carnival and you have somebody give you a prediction about the future. You understand that it's an amusement, but if someone actually took seriously and literally what they were told, you know, you'd kind of sit them down and, you know, read them the riot act about what's serious in life and what isn't. So I'm not going to predict when it's going to happen, and I wouldn't pay attention to anybody who did. Uh, it's just not a doable thing. Mm -hmm. But if you know, as we do, that the system has a downturn every four to seven years, and if you know that the last bottom we hit was roughly 2009, maybe early 2010, and you add four to seven to that, then you know that we are due for another one. Doesn't mean it'll happen in 2018 or even 2019, but that we're going to have a downturn. That's not my problem to justify. It's the problem of anyone who thinks we won't after 300 years confirming that statistic are behind us. It's for those people to give us any reason not to believe it's coming. And since, as you point out, we are a people in record levels of personal debt, corporate debt, and government debt, and we have people living paycheck to paycheck, which all the statistics you listed, which are accurate, uh, show, then you have to understand that, yes, we're at the kind of the knife edge here, and it wouldn't take very much of a downturn to begin to have a cascading downward spiral kind of effect because we are living the way we do uh, and not taking the steps to protect ourselves as a nation. Uh, and unfortunately, that's the way this system works. You know, if, if everybody is subjected morning, noon, and night to an endless barrage of advertisements telling you that you're not a really good citizen, you're not a successful person unless you buy this and buy that. Of course, we have a population that not only spends the money it earns, but borrows money, trying to keep up with this incredible barrage of capitalist enterprises paying for the advertising without which they can't survive. But the end result is the economy as a whole is in very great state of vulnerability. Well, one of the points that that you made, Richard Wolf, and I listened to your lecture on it uh, uh, on the 200th anniversary of the uh, of the birth of Karl Marx, was that we really, in economics and in sociology, philosophy, and so on, we really in this country don't have an intellectual tradition of listening to the critics of capitalism. We have the kind of what might be called the liberal wing of capitalism represented by certain thinkers or the ones who might uh, say it needs a little bit more regulation. You have the conservative wing of capitalism that says maybe it needs less regulation, but with the paramount figure in among the critics being Karl Marx, we really don't have a tradition in, the, in this country of actually studying people who have uh, stepped outside the framework of capitalist thinking and said, hmm, what might be wrong with the system? Why is the system so prone to malfunction? Why are so many people unable to meet their basic needs? Why do so many people subjectively appear to be suffering and experiencing stress or alienation? And uh, I think, uh, I don't want to speak for you, but I think one of, your, your main, one of your main points has been, maybe we ought to give those folks more of a listen. Yeah, let me, let me get at it this way. Um, I am, a, me personally now, I am a product of what ma many Americans believe to be the peak, the epitome of uh, 
formal education. So I went to Harvard as an undergraduate. Then I went on to Stanford University in California to get a master's degree in economics. And I finished my education at Yale University where I got my PhD in economics. In all those years, 10 years of my life spent going through these Ivy League institutions, studying economics, no one ever assigned to me, no one ever required the students in all the books and articles we were required to read, no one ever required me to read Marx's Capital, the book that in a sense is the foundation for the critique of capitalism in the way that Adam Smith and David Ricardo are the foundation for the celebration of capitalism. You know, I always found this to be above all an indictment of American education and a kind of pathetic commentary. And here's why. I use the simple metaphor. If you wanted to understand the family that lived up the street from you, and you knew there was a father and a mother and two children, and you also knew that one of the children thought that this was the greatest family ever to exist in the world, and the other one thought it was a psychological basket case. If you wanted to understand the family, would you choose to speak to only one child, either one? And the answer, I think every reasonable person would understand, no, that's silly. You speak to both children, and then you draw the conclusions that your questions and your reflection lead you to. Well, a, a, a capitalist economy is the same thing as that family up the street. Of course, you should read Adam Smith and the whole mainstream tradition that thinks capitalism is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But you should also read the critics and then draw your own conclusion. But for 50 years, the last 50, this country has been so caught up in the Cold War and its aftermath that it withheld from young people going to school to learn any sustained contact with the critical school. And you know, in the end, that's self-defeating. It shows no confidence in your own children and their ability to learn. It is the behavior of frightened people. There's no justification whatsoever for that. And I think we're suffering in this country in part because of whatever the leadership we have, Trump or the others, these are people with no sustained awareness of the critical approach, which hobbles them in terms of what they understand and what they do. Well, you know, it's interesting because, and again, we're talking with Professor Richard Wolf, host of the <clears throat> program Economic Update on Free Speech TV. It's, it, it's interesting because you and I grew up in an era when uh, the Cold War was in full force, and uh, I suppose people might say, well, that's the enemy ideology. Even that doesn't make sense when you think about it, <clears throat> because even if you name somebody uh, the philosopher for your enemy, you want to know, presumably, what they're thinking. Uh, but, that, but, you know, the Cold War uh, ideology of this country was the... I thought was the excuse for discouraging people from studying Marx, for example. Uh, but the Cold War has been over for some time now, and yet it seems that it is just as taboo as ever uh, in certain circles, policy-making circles, for example, or media circles where people write about the economy and policy issues to ever bring up uh, um, an idea from Marx, for example. People seem to sort of pale and slink away from you when you do that. And I wonder why this social taboo remains. It's not because they think you're going to spy for the Soviet Union. So what's going on? Is this just a lot rigid enforcement of an ideology? Is it a tribal culture? Is it all of the above? None of the above? What do you think? Well, there I think you're on to something. And I think I would have to fault my own profession, that is professional economists, and to show you how powerful they can be. This is, if you like, a tribal group. You know, you go to college, then you go to graduate school, you spend a lot of time, money, you finally get that PhD, uh, you write a doctoral dissertation, 
and you hope that the research you do for the dissertation gets you a good starting job as an assistant professor somewhere, and you move up the ladder. And the way you move up the ladder is to write articles and books, uh, get them positively evaluated and refereed by your colleagues, get them published, move up the ladder to become a full professor with power in a department. Well, if for 50 years, the way you did that was to celebrate capitalism, to say it was wonderful. And when you saw around you the very few people who were critical or even explored that, get their fingers slapped and shown that this is not a smart career move, what you have then is an economics profession that had already committed itself in what it knew how to do, what its reputation was, in doing celebratory work about capitalism all the time and critical work about capitalism as little as possible, which in most cases was next to nothing. So when the Cold War is over, that's all well and good. But for the profession, they had vested interests, they had long-term appointments in universities, and they kept doing what they knew how to do. They taught what they knew to the next generation, whether they wanted it or not. They kept rewarding one another for the celebration of capitalism and never for the criticism of it. I don't think you would even see people like me on the radio and television if I didn't have the pedigree from the fancy universities uh, to be my kind of uh, cover, if you like, my kind of entree as a credentialed commentator. So I think what we have is a sad reality. Where people get trained in economics, and I'm talking about journalists, politicians, businessmen and women, and so on, they get trained by the community of professors of economics, and they are a good two to three decades late in terms of adjusting to a post-Cold War world. We're going to need a new generation of young economists who are now there and beginning to explore, but they have to slowly uh, push the older generation out because they are holding on to, for dear life to what their careers are, what their professional reputations are, and they have no more opening to the left now than they did at the height of the Cold War. Well, and the result is we're not really uh, looking at the full range of solutions or ideas that are available to us. For example, uh, alienation. Um, maybe you can say a little bit about uh, what Marx had to say about alienation, because it seems to me it explains a lot of what ex people are experiencing nowadays. But uh, uh, I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to embarrass myself in front of the experts. So maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about what alienation is. Sure. It's one of the signal ideas that Marx developed. And, you know, there are a lot of ways to get at it, but very briefly. If the idea is that something happens to a human being, if he or she spend hours and hours, day after day, working somewhere where they invest where they contribute their brains and their muscles, their body and their mind, to producing things. But at the end of the day, when they have produced, poured themselves into the production of a good or service, they are told, it's now five o'clock, you go home and you leave here what you helped to produce. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your employer. And that employer will decide what happens to it, what is done with it, what use it's put to. You have no say in any of that. You have no control over any of that. This is experience, Marx argued, as a kind of tearing you away from your own product. It's like having a small child make a little project at school and then come home and have an older sibling snatch it out of the child's hand and make off with it. It has an effect on you. It, dis it In a way, it disconnects your, 
your heart, your soul, your personality from the work you do. And that has short and long term psychological effects that are very, very profound and drive a wedge, if you like, between different parts of you. Let me make it very concrete in a way that Americans may relate to. Earlier today, before you uh, started talking with me, I read a report from the Center of Disease for Disease Control of the United States government out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. It was a report just issued about the suicide rate in the United States, which they report has gone up by 30% from 1999 to 2016. Last, in 2016, the last year for which we have complete statistics, 45,000 Americans took their own lives. Half of them had known mental health problems, but half of them didn't. Half of them used firearms, but half of them didn't. I would argue that whether we look at suicide or, for example, the opioid crisis in this country, we are seeing effects that have many causes, but one of those causes is a system that systematically separates people from what they have poured their creative minds and bodies into producing, and that that is part of any real solution to these problems. And that's why I'm a critic of capitalism, because I see a cooperative way of producing a way of producing in which the, the workers, the people who make goods and services together become their own employers. They're self-employed as a group so that they can continue to determine together what to do with the work they've done. So they won't be alienated from the part of themselves that is a productive worker. And, and these are old ideas within the Marxian tradition, but they are a valuable thought-provoking kind of insight, which we deny ourselves if we keep the Marxian critical perspective out of our conversations, out of our universities, the way we have been doing. So worker-owned, worker-run businesses, democracy at work, is, is one way to address that problem of alienation. You know, as we conclude our conversation, uh, uh, Richard, Professor Wolf, it, it, it seems to me that, uh, okay, so we, we, we live under a system where we suffer this, most of us suffer this alienation, where many or most of us live in constant financial uncertainty, you know, in previous eras, you know, as Marx said, religion was the opiate of the masses, it was one of the ways that people were convinced, well, it's God's will that you should suffer like this. Now it seems to me we have media, we have culture, we have, uh, you know, this sort of exaltation of the wealth of other people and this myth that maybe you could make it to, that that's the, the new opiate of the masses, or maybe a little bit of the old opiate left in to, it seems to me the solution is to start talking about some of these uh, alternative ideas, including uh, the Marxist ideas you've been talking about. So where can people go uh, to find out more about what you're doing and uh, the ideas that you're uh, promoting? And where can people go for that matter to find out more about Marx's ideas? Well, one of the places uh, is really what we do. We are advocates for a new economic arrangement where workers together cooperatively produce that enterprises, instead of being run as top-down kind of dictatorships where the major shareholders and this board of directors make all the decisions, but instead one person, one vote deciding. You know, if democracy is good for our politics, it strikes us that it would be very good for our, dem our economy, at least as much so. And indeed, we go so far as to suggest that if you don't have a democratic economy, it's very hard to have a genuine uh, democratic politics. But in any case, we maintain a variety of platforms where people can learn all about this. It starts with websites where the main one I would urge people to take a look at is called democracyatwork.info, I-N-F-O. Secondly, my own website where a lot of the Marxian stuff is available. That's simple, rdwolf with two Fs, dot com. Uh, we are all over YouTube, uh, you can find it, Richard Wolf, or the name of our weekly radio and television program, 
economic update, which, as you kindly mentioned, is available on Free Speech TV every week, but is also available in a variety of other forms on YouTube, etc. And we would welcome, uh, all of these things are available without charge 24-7, and we would welcome all of your viewers and listeners uh, to make themselves uh, aware of and make use of this material. That's why we put it there. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you for your time. There's so much I didn't get to ask you about, but uh, maybe we'll have another chance. In any case, Richard Wolf, uh, economist, professor, and host of Economic Update, uh, thanks for coming on the program. Well, Richard, I like the fact that we have the same first name, and I really mean it. I would be glad to talk with you again. This was a good conversation, and this is so important to get out into the public space that I'd be glad to, to do it again. Well, thank you so much.